Welcome, friends, and thank you for joining us for the Voices of Trinity podcast. Jim and I are joined today by a good friend, special guest, Dr. Jeff Olive, the pastor of church multiplication at the Woodlands Methodist Church. And Jeff has spent the last 20 years specializing in new church starts as a church planter himself and then a mentor and coach. You could say it's an area of passion. So the church multiplication projects uh, that he's working on are truly inspiring. Uh, he's usually a busy guy, but he's been especially busy over the last year developing dynamic new platforms for helping equip church planters, getting the training uh, that new church planters need to embark on this journey. So welcome, Jeff. So glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's good to catch up with you guys this way. It's almost like we have to sit down at a podcast to, <laughs> to find the time to have a conversation. This is good. Yeah, it's great. And of course, we have Jim with us as well. Jeff, it's good, uh, great to have you and look forward to the conversation today. Likewise. Yeah. And I'm Jason Burnham and uh, thrilled to be uh, here with Jeff today to hear about planting. First of all, I just was hoping you could give us a uh, a frame of reference, your initial passion for, for church planting. Everybody has mm. an origin story. Mm. And so just want to give some of that framework. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know part of my story. I didn't grow up in the church. And so I came to faith when I was 21 years old and mm. did not have a clue. Like my first experience after I had this like epiphany encounter was to go to the library and check out books and say, what just happened? Like I had no <laughs> idea what happened. The long and the short of it is I w went around and tried a bunch of churches, uh, Pentecostal churches and Presbyterian churches and Lutheran and Baptist and wound up at a Methodist church at an 830 service and looked out at the crowd, a sea of gray hair, 21 years old, <laughs> this gray hair in front of me, but something in my spirit said, this is home. Uh -huh. and it just felt like home. And uh, strangely enough, that afternoon, two ladies from the church came and knocked on my door and said, we have a Bible study starting tonight. We'd like you to come and join us? And I said, absolutely. So I went to the grocery store, bought a Bible, a King James Bible at the grocery <laughs> store. I had no idea. I mean, I had no clue. Showed up. It was the, the red letter edition. Yeah, I had not anything that I read letter. I mean, it was, it, and uh, showed up. It was disciple. It was a first night of disciple one Bible study. Wow. They didn't tell me it was like, a, you know, <laughs> and this two, is a commitment, two and a half begin. hour commitment for nine months, mm -hmm. you know, a couple hours of reading a day, had no clue, but jumped in. And it was during the course of that, that I was like, you know what? I believe I believe, and I was baptized uh, and then began my journey. Uh, but it, strangely enough, part of the journey of church planting was I had no idea people had planted churches. I mean, I mean, they were there. It's like, it's like a child realizing for the first time that, you know, people are there. But that like, your parents were born. Yeah, right, time. your parents were born. It's like, where did they come from? Like, haven't they always been there? It's like, Jim, hasn't Jim always been here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they yes, they answered definitively yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't until, truthfully, after I graduated seminary, serving my first appointment, that I was in a downtown church, and I realized that there was people who were moving south of town that would never drive downtown. And I thought, well, how are we going to reach them? And started thinking of ways and, you know, what does this look like? And it wasn't until I went to annual conference that year for the first time someone talked about church planting. And I thought, church planting? And that was a seed. It was just like a spark. And it took root. And, you know, really I've been on the journey ever since in one way or another for the entirety of my ministry. I don't know how this happened. I mean, it's one of those, I just fell into it. And now I've been, you know, involved with church planting for 20 years. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Tell us about the, the, the plant that you started in Tyler at Dayspring. How did that come about? Right. Uh, what was your experience with that? What did you learn from that? So what everyone will learns from church planting is it's hard. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And um, the, the impetus really, again, was the sense that there are people who aren't being reached who will never reach at the location where I was, I was a pastor at a downtown church and saw that there was a growing side of town and, and really felt compelled, felt called to, to do this. And my wife felt the same sense of calling and all That's of this. The That's the miracle, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and so we have two kids. She calls it our third child because, you know, had it not been for the church, we probably would have had another child. I mean, it was just all consuming this, mm. this moment. 
early on she she worked with me in the church plant and one night she turned around to me in bed i was telling her hey tomorrow we need to do this make make a note of that and she said we have two options i said okay what are my options she said you can fire me or i'm going to quit (laughs) and so i mean it was like this wake-up moment i realized like our life was consumed with church planting and it's hard and how do you set those kind of you know boundary Boundary. parameters of church planting so I, i learned some of that honestly like how do you set parameters how do you set boundaries it's difficult to do Mm -hmm. because it's an all-consuming piece and so how do you integrate it into your life i've learned a lot of things about uh, really evangelism that we talk about but we don't do a lot of in many of our established churches Um, learned a lot um, about uh, about discipleship and how to take people on a journey and children's ministry so it's and maybe this is a side conversation maybe at some point but there's a lot of things that churches can learn about revitalization from church planters sure right because there a new church can move into a community churches have been established there for a long time they're rocking along at 40 or 50 people and a new church pops up and within a year they have 300 people and you go wait i didn't even know that was possible how did they do it and so it's like how does a new church that doesn't have resources that they don't have people they don't have a facility they don't have all these things how do they start in a community and reach people that people who seemingly have facilities and resources have struggled to do. So those are some of the lessons that you know. You, you've mentioned the relationship with your wife and right. uh, some of the tension involved in starting a new church, particularly with time pressures. Mm. I know the the church movement, church growth movement that got started really at the beginning of my ministry, and I was invited uh, to consider being a church planner. But all around me, what I was seeing was uh, mostly men who were who were planning churches. Yeah most of whom were going through divorces right. mm. because of the time pressures involved. Well, I don't know, lots of other things. If, if there's somebody listening to us who's considering that call to church planning, what would your advice be to those folk to help deal with that time pressure? I mean, you mentioned setting boundaries, right. but is there anything else we could learn from you? Well, you're a church planner too, so right. that we could learn from both of you or that folks who are listening could learn who might be sensing that call yeah. to plan a church. I'm curious, Jason, your experience in the same way. Like, yeah. how did you set boundaries? Because we, we were planting about the same time originally. Yeah, um, so my wife Lauren worked with me uh, at the early days of the plant, and similarly, right. we, we actually we had learned from, uh, from, from you and from our buddy Matt Neely that there was wisdom in, mm. in that lasting for a season. Right. And so we actually had a strategic sunset of that, of that cooperative work environment. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that one of the critical elements that, that I, I can't under play is the the need to have a prayer team around you and and committed to praying over you and your family uh along with the work of the plan it's almost like the the prayer for the launch team and and the pastor and the pastor's family has to be kind of at the forefront and so i've recruited people that that i had relationships with all throughout my my upbringing and my and my seminary life and then invited them to to really invest in that time of prayer and kept them updated on what those prayer needs were as well right yeah i think uh, one of the psalms that hit me about two years into the plant is the the psalm that says that reads unless the lord builds the house those who labor labor in vain Mm -hmm. um and i just realized that i was building this i mean i realized you know there's so much of my that i felt like it was my strength or i felt that it was dependent on me or every week I was driving up to the movie theater, I felt like a house of cards. I just felt like, is it, you know, the whole thing going to crumble this week? Is anyone going to show? Anyone going to no, show no, up? No, no one's coming this is week. Is my it's wife over. even going to come this morning? You know, and um, and, but at some point, my my really advice is just to take heart. It is not your work. You're doing the work, but it is God's work, mm. and it is God's acting in this that is going to make it happen or won't happen. So. Mm-hmm. It's an extraordinary journey, obviously, that you both have been on. And I remember when I was a superintendent, um, I attended church planting school um, with a number of pastors who were who were interested in it. Jim Griffith taught that class. Yeah, we, we both went to it. I bet you did. Okay? Right. And, and I remember distinctly some of the things he said about church planting personalities, that these mm-hmm. were men and women with entrepreneurial spirits okay? yeah. or entrepreneurial gifts that once they planted a church, that the, the the opportunities for them to stay, they were not particularly gifted, okay, at um, staying long term at a church, okay, mm. but were really gifted at calling people together. 
Um, I've not sensed that in both of you. Right. I mean, because y'all stayed a long time at both churches. How do you bridge that gap between the entrepreneurial outreach and the passion for winning people to Christ and then the establishment of building a system to keep mm-hmm. those people and disciple them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think over time, really what I've sensed is that there are a lot of personalities that can plant a church. Yeah. You just have strengths in, in different areas. And some people have that entrepreneurial spirit. Now, you need that. You need that self-starting aspect, sure. whatever your personality type yeah, is. No matter what. But you're going to have weaknesses, right? And so I'm going to be strong in some areas and weak in others. And what I found with pastors who've stayed a long time is that they have grown with their church. Like mm-hmm. in their areas where they were weak over time, they grew as their church grew. And the other foundational piece, piece for people who stayed a long time is they didn't do it themselves. That's right. <clears throat> they got help. You know? yeah. They got help. They yeah. knew that, hey, I'm strong over here, but I'm weak over here, and I'm going to find people who can come around and do this. That is where, you know, going back to the burnout question, or the, that's where I've seen most people burn out, is that they think, okay, I'm in charge of evangelism. I've got to over make sure that children's ministry is going okay. I'm, I'm the one sound checking Sunday morning. I'm doing all of this. <laughs> and it's just unsustainable, right? Yeah. And you just burn out over time. Um, but I've seen so many personalities that have lasted for the long haul that have reinvented themselves as their church has grown over the years. Yeah, I think that's that, that's a key is uh, is to have the right people come alongside to understand that you're not doing it all. Mm-hmm. And so maybe some advice for church planters is, hey, uh, if you're still setting up every single week when you're uh, when now you have uh, teams of folks, hey, that you could probably take a step back. And, uh, and yeah, maybe show up and, and help out and pitch in, but it doesn't depend on you in isolation and, and learn ways to really just release people for the work. You mentioned, Jeff, um, uh, what you learned about revitalization from, from church planting. And, and in, um, in the Global Methodist Church, many of the churches that have come into our connection mm-hmm. are churches that are comprised of older people, okay? Uh, in smaller or rural communities or in um, uh, county seat town churches, uh, that those churches have gradually declined over the years for lots of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've tried my hand at revitalization in lots of places, but how do you envision that? What can you say to us who are leaders in the global church okay, about helping to equip churches to go past where they are now. I'll give you a quick story. I uh, got a call last week from a, from a pastor. Actually, it was a pastor's retreat uh, mm-hmm. that I had this conversation. A guy was pastoring a church in a small town in Arkansas. Okay? They had down to three or four people. They sold the building to another denomination. And within two months' time, the place was overrun with people. Okay? Now, how do you explain that? Yeah. And how would that kind of anecdote help us understand what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. I think one of the one of the things that I never want a church to feel is like shame or guilt. Like we haven't done a good enough job. We've failed in some way. Truth of the matter is that many of the things that once worked no longer work. It's like sure. we, it's like when the antenna changed for the television, they told you for a long time, like this signal's going away. <laughs> like you need to move over to digital. The rabbit ears, you can have At rabbit ears. In my house, we had black and white until the color and, was until always it, done. Until I mean, it's, that until just it's, wouldn't no, go the, for it. The right. aluminum foil only <laughs> right. worked for so long. Uh, so you're I, saying I can still call a landline yeah, at your yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you can. No, it's gone. Okay. Okay. We don't have a landline okay. anymore. <laughs> Because we don't want to pay for it. We're cheap. <laughs> so, uh, well, cheap is the mother of all inventions. There we go. Say. <laughs> the, um, and, and part of it is, does, you know, like the culture has changed. I mean, you, even if you try, you can't pick up the signal because the signal is gone in, yeah. in that s- scenario. And churches are trying to do the things that once worked and saying to themselves, this is hard. Like, why isn't it working now? It's just society has changed. This The situation in which they're in has changed. So... It, it, the question is, how do we equip those individuals to to pick up on a new signal, to broadcast mm. the new signal to the community, so the community can hear them again? They just can't. They can't hear it any longer. And it's uh, there. There is some deep learning from new churches that helps established churches. Established churches, once you're once you have settled into a rhythm, your primary questions is about, hey, what do we like here? What do we want here? What do we prefer here? And those questions inevitably lead to decline. And the questions that churches in revitalization have to ask is, what does the community want? What do they like? What do they need? And those are the kinds of 
questions that lead ultimately to the just the beginning of a road to revitalization. I love that yeah. metaphor, the, this, this idea of, of broadcasting the same content, the same gospel right. that, that, that never fails. Right on a new signal. Mm -hmm. It's it's not it's not a new gospel, it's the same gospel, but it's on a new signal. Yeah. And I think that's a, a really insightful turn. Um, so so you ha said that, that, that church planning has been a part of your entire ministry in one way or another, which which I've borne witness to, but, but how did you land at the Woodlands Methodist Church and what is your role at the Woodlands in church planting, church multiplication? How was that defined? How in the world did they recruit you? Uh, and, 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 and how did they land you at the Woodlands? So I was a superintendent in our previous denomination and God worked. God bless us. Yeah, yeah. So God bless us. <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, you know, it was quite a season. I mean, it was a season of disaffiliation and worked through that and just walked alongside churches who were making their own discernment. They were in the season and, and my job wasn't to uh, push them in any way. My, my job was simply to walk with the churches who chose to to enter a path of discernment and allow them the opportunity to get to where they believed God was calling them. But they were making their decision at the same time I was making mine as the denomination was changing and shifting and we saw the direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I entered just a season of long discernment and prayer. And that, that, was, that was one of the uh, most difficult seasons. I've always felt like I, I had direction. I knew that God had something next for me. And at that season, I had no idea what was next or what God was going to do. I mean, when I entered the United Methodist Church, I thought this is an institution, it's going to last forever, forever. you yeah. know? It, it, and in that season, what I felt the Lord say is, Jeff, you've got to put your will aside in all of this. And if you really want to know my will, just set yours aside. And ultimately, there was a number of opportunities came along, but the Woodlands had this passion and calling for they wanted to be involved in church planting. And they knew they were entering a new season. And uh, so they invited me to come along and I said, let's do this. Jeff, I remember whenever you were in early conversations uh, at the Woodlands Methodist, imagining what it would be like to be uh, in this church multiplication endeavor. And, and the conversation turned and, and they asked you a question. They said, they said uh, where, where does this end? Where does this go? What are the bounds uh, through which we would set our priorities for church planting? And what did you say? It was this moment of dreaming and visioning. And, and the question now stepping into this new thing is how far can we go? And the answer was to the ends of the earth. And, and it just clicked. Everyone was like, yes, that's, that's how far this can go, to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and, and, and it, it's been amazing to see how, how the Woodlands has, has been so invested in, in multiplication, but not in any uh, narrow or siloed way. So give us a picture of what this kind of global perspective of multiplication looks like at the Woodlands. And then we're going to turn, turn face towards uh, a particular resource that has been developed. Yeah, that, that was a piece. Uh, you know, they, the Woodlands was trying to capture a picture of what church multiplication looked like in this new season for them. And uh, then affiliating with the Global Methodist Church and saying, okay, what is, you know, not just what can we get from this denomination, because what these, can give, yeah. what can we give? And these are our sisters and brothers. We are in a connection together. That's a beautiful thing about being Methodist is mm -hmm. this, the sense of connectionalism uh, that we have. And so we have, a, we have really kind of three tracks that we're running on at the Woodlands. One is how are we contributing globally to the global church? How are we contributing to church multiplication in the U.S.? And then the smaller piece of the portfolio is how, what do our campuses look like? How, do, how are we multiplying our campuses? So we've been working in all three of those arenas. We worked in the United Arab Emirates over the last year wow. and a half. Um, the, I saw an article today talking about, so we, we began with one church plant in the UAE. Now there are seven churches in the UAE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, just in a various areas that are now connected to the mega Manila annual conference, oh, provisional an annual in the conference yeah. in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, so those are churches that, that we uh, poured into, that, that we started, that we invested in to get started and then said, okay, y'all are up and going. How do we connect you with someone who can walk with you for the rest of, rest of this journey? So we're looking at kind of globally that, but also in the U.S., how do we invest ourselves in a way that make sure that we are just not part of the newest dying denomination, <laughs> but that we are part of a denomination that's thriving and growing and having new babies. Yeah. So you talked about the newest dying denomination that I think there's a, 
uh, interesting context within which the Global Methodist Church has been born, and that is that that denominations broadly and and Christendom churches yeah. uh, are in decline in the U.S. particularly. So so how do you frame that up when churches are closing in the U.S.? What's the necessity frame frame that help us to understand the necessity for church planting in this culture of closure? Yeah. Uh, well, statistically, at least the latest statistics that are out there are, are that there are 4,500 churches that close in the U.S. every year, 4,500. 3,000 are starting every year. So there's still a delta of about 1,500 churches that are closing. They're just, you know, it's, it's, there's an imbalance. Um, so you have churches closing on one hand, but yet on the other hand, you have population increase. Mm. So it's worse than it seems, really. Even mm. when you talk about, well, 1,500 churches a year, are we have fewer uh, but we have more and more people. And so uh, what we, we know that the opportunity is there. And we also know that in a denomination, and I, I think this statistic is right. I'm not sure how they came to it, but there's a, uh, that uh, exponential has a statistic that a denomination has to plant 3% the, of the number of its churches every year to maintain. Mm. 3%. So for every 100 churches we have, we've got to launch three churches um, to get them to continue our path of sustainability over the long term and more even so uh, global methodist church 4500 churches one percent is you do the math, 45 400, now 400, we're at yeah i mean that's 450 right yeah it's wild a year that we need to be planting and and so we've been in a season of of disaffiliation so we have this kind of season in which we're starting churches by a kind of accidental birth um, if we were Baptist, we may be better at this, but we're, we don't know church splits very well, quite honestly. I mean, we're just figuring this out. But this season is going to end. I mean, so there's two parts. How do we help our sisters and brothers who've lost a, a vote or weren't able to even have a vote who are trying to plant an Orthodox Wesleyan church in their community? That's one side of it. But that season is going to come to an end. And the other, how do we empower and train planters just who are see a need in their community somewhere else to do this work? We need to walk alongside both. One of, one of my pressing interests uh, for years has been the, ch- the, the, the churches in urban areas mm-hmm. and, and the lack of, uh, uh, of growth of churches, uh, of Wesleyan churches in those areas. Um, you were the superintendent of the North District, so was I, and then I moved to a central Houston area mm-hmm. and had all the churches inside Beltway 8. Uh, and there were a few strong churches, but there were multiple churches that were dying that had been planted in neighborhoods that had long since changed and the church had not. Right. So they were worshiping you know, a dozen people, 20 people that needed some sort of boost revitalization, mm-hmm. worked really hard at that. Mm-hmm. In the current uh, 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 culture, that where global Methodism has started, we don't have, at least in our conference, we don't have churches in urban areas. Okay? Um, we have churches in suburban areas that are fast growing, churches in rural and county seat towns, but nothing really in that urban area. Mm-hmm. How do you envision that, Jeff, as a church planter? How would we go about planting churches in Houston uh, that reflect the diversity of the population. I'm talking about the racial diversity and language diversity in the population. How do we minister to those folk? I got all kinds of stories about that right. that I tried that didn't work. Uh, but I, I'm just curious from somebody experienced like you are, how do we go about that? How, how do we begin to think and pray about planting churches um, uh, in those inner city areas that are booming in growth? Right. I mean, part of it is the the simple demographics, and y'all, you you know this. I mean, the, some of these neighborhoods were once Anglo neighborhoods. The neighborhood has changed. Some people are still commuting in, but the demographics are different. Listen, the, some of those neighborhoods have changed three times since we had any strength at all. Yeah, well, that well, a, absolutely true. And the other demographic, uh, the other demographic challenge is in terms of uh, raising up African American leaders, Hispanic leaders who are Wesleyan. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them went Pentecostal or Baptist or non-denominational. And so we've lost some really strong leaders. And part of it was because we had these 
educational requirements that required them yep. to leave the, some of their bivocational ministry that they were yep. doing mm-hmm. or just presented economic challenges where they couldn't even attain those educational goals that they wanted to attain. And I think that's one of the beauty beauties of the Global Methodist Church is that some of those barriers have been taken down, yeah. mm-hmm. whereby some of those individuals have a Wesleyan heart. They may not even know it yet, but they have a Wesleyan heart of God's grace and God's goodness. Um, but now we can train and equip them without presenting kind of like a too too high bar of an yeah. economic challenge or or leaving their current employment challenge to go ahead and plant in the communities where they live. That's what you need. We need people who are planting in the communities where they're already planted. They know the people. They know the community. And we struggle to do that in our previous denomination. How do we find those people? I mean, how do we do, how do we discover those who are in those neighborhoods um, that are um, uh, passionate about Jesus and eager to see the kingdom grow. Jason, how how are we doing it as a conference? Yeah. I'm going to kick well, it back to you. As why a, do you think I'm asking the yeah, question? Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder. I, yeah, I mean, I'm curious. I have my thoughts, but I'm, I don't know how we how we are working as a conference. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things that that are at the forefront. The first is to be engaged in intentional recruitment in the seminaries, and and not just mm-hmm. seminaries that 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 are known commodities that, that we have a huge presence in, like uh, like Asbury or Truett at Baylor, but for us to also consider, well, what is it for us to go to Gamma? What, it is, what is it for us to go to other places where there might be uh, a, a larger percentage of, of diverse population that we could engage with? But I, I think that uh, Jim had this opportunity a few weeks ago, and I think that th- this just shows the kind of uh, investment and call that we have is he went to a, a large African-American uh, church leadership conference and just had a presence there to engage in conversation to be sure that people knew that there was opportunity uh, and so I think that those kind of cultivate that kind of work of cultivating relationships is right. going to be essential as we continue to move I also think that one of the things we need to be looking at is who are those in our churches uh, or in our university settings near us that that are from these communities mm-hmm. Uh, that have a passion, a heart for the gospel in these communities, and how do we uh, resource them, support them, and then deploy them? Right. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that, that the work that Christ Church College Station does and, and, the, and the work that Jerry House is doing there in relating to the folks at, at A&M, like that, that's so critical because mm-hmm. we're raising up the next generation of leaders in that way. We were connected to the uh, Chinese American caucus of Methodist churches and um so we we've worked with them and and they have a heart for multiplying orthodox wesleyan churches as well so uh recently this year we have launched a fellowship helping to support that chinese american fellowship they're meeting at our church right now now one day we're going to send them off and they're going to be their own congregation by themselves but for this season we're just walking alongside of them as they get started I think it's, it's, it's reaching the relationships that we know, expanding them out, working with multiplication networks, finding people, and just taking the opportunities that are there. I mean, in an old system, that would have been very difficult to do. Yeah. Right now, we can say, hey, there's an opportunity. We see a need. Let's find a pastor to do this work, and let's uh, walk alongside them to kind of uh, cultivate areas in which we've lacked for quite a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim, uh, when you were in the in the kind of city center. You, you tell stories about, uh, about uh, Spanish language communities coming and being interested, having Wesleyan DNA, having a heart for connectionalism, a desire to be a part, but, but these, the educational these are independent, requirements. Independent charismatic churches right. led by pastors, founding pastors that had grown dr- dramatically over the years who were searching for connection. They, they were simply uh, incomplete without a connection to other bodies okay, who would come to me and invite a conversation about becoming a Methodist. Because of the education requirements, we could bring whole churches in, but we couldn't bring pastors yeah, in. Right, yeah, and right. the churches are not coming with their pastors. You're right about one thing. We do have a distinct advantage. And I think as time goes by, we'll see more of that. Yeah. We'll see more of these independent churches who, as you say, are led by people who are Wesleyans without knowing they're Wesleyans, right. okay? yes. who will search for that connection. We're not there yet, yeah. but I think we will get there. Tell tell us about a bit. Um, I could talk to you about church planting all day, but I really want to hear about Planters Field, okay? Okay. And about what you've done with that, and what you see as the future of Planters Field uh, for this passion you have for church planting. Mm-hmm. So one of the uh, 
when the Woodlands began to work on church multiplication, we just dreamt like how, how began kind of really digging in, like how are we going to contribute in a way to the Global Methodist Church that is impactful and significant? Where can we give our best? So there are a lot of thoughts like, okay, well, we can host, we can host events here and fly people add, in. Add another conference. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. We can add another conference <laughs> to our conference <laughs> schedule. Um, uh, and is, is that, but that's one way. The other way was, well, I guess we could fly around and go to different regions and try to host conferences. Um, but all of it just looked like, um, it felt like a lot of work for maybe not as much return as we hoped. Mm. And um, so how do we best use the time that we have? How do we best use the finances that we have? And how do we best use the time and the finances of the individuals we're trying to trying to reach with this material? And those and if you were to go with that model of either having them come come in or, or you go to other places, it, it would look like some things that were already out there. Right. Uh, it would be replicating work that already was was being accomplished. Right. And so what we learned, I mean, what, what the world learned during COVID is that hey, actually we can do things online and some of it is less, but then some of it you actually is better online and you can and do it. And so uh, for Planters Field, we envisioned a, a church planting training that people could you do when they're bivocational. They could do it in their evening. They could do it at their own pace. Uh, they could work through it with a team. They did not have to fly somewhere, buy hotel rooms and do registration fees and all of the things. Now, th there's a beauty in gathering together and doing this work. And, and we know that too, because there's a camaraderie that goes along with that. Um, but every, it's not possible for everyone. And if we are going to reach the number of people that we want reached, we're going to train the number of people that we must have yeah. trained to do this, yeah. it was going to take a new kind of level of thinking. Um, so, th so that really moved us in the direction of of doing an online training, online platform. And we looked, if someone, if there's another training out there that's online in a robust way like this, I don't know what, don't it, know is. what it is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it is. So um, so we just decided, let's invest ourselves fully in this new training platform. So when that idea came and you landed it and it was, this is where we're going, did you have any clue the, the amount of work <laughs> that it was going to take to build a, a, a state of the art, a, a premier, Right. platform yeah. for online training for right. church planning? Um, it, it's like a lot of things you enter, you don't have a clue until you do it, right? <laughs> you just don't have a clue. So I, I envisioned kind of a three month timeline and it was more like <laughs> seven months, eight months. I mean, Which is still a crazy time. aggressive. It's still a crazy aggressive timeline. Yeah. Um, but it, the, we could have taken more time to do it, um, but we could do it well in the amount of time that we did, number one. And the other, the other part is people needed it. They were reaching out as soon as they heard that something was going to be available. They're like, how do we access this training? And you all know this. There are lay people. There are clergy. There are communities without a Global Methodist Church. And people are hungry to receive some training to do this. So we just said, okay, let's, let's put our efforts behind this. Yeah. Let's get this up and going. Yeah, so, so Planners Field. Uh, I mean, tell us about the name. Like, I'd love yeah. to know. I mean where the conversation led and how the Holy Spirit directed that yeah. uh, to, to, to really be the platform. Yeah. So we thought a lot about church planters, uh, but then we also thought about the parable of Jesus in Matthew 13 of this, this sower who goes out to sow and he's sowing seed and his, the seed is being scattered everywhere. Mm. It's being scattered on the rocky path. It's being, uh, it's on the path on the rocky way. It's being scattered among the thorns. Uh, and then some of it falls on good soil also. And the, di the disciples are like, you know, pull Jesus aside afterward. They're like, hey, what are you talking about? Like, we, we don't know what you're, we don't know what you mean. Uh, which, you know, honestly, I wouldn't have either, right? Who of us? And Jesus said, well, you, you got to have eyes to see. You have to have ears to hear. Um, but ultimately he talks about, you know, the rocky soil is those who, the, they spring up quickly, but then they fade away. Or the path where the birds come and take it away or the thorns where you begin to grow, but then the thorns grow and take it over. But the good soil is the place where the people hear and respond to the word of God. Mm. Um, and so as church planters, there, there's two pieces of this. One, you've got to form the planter to do the sowing. And that's part of this planter's field. You've got to prepare yourself in order to do the work. And two, you've got to prepare the soil. And the soil is the community in which you're going to plant, the church in which you're going to do the work. And so it takes really both of that prepar preparation. And, and so what we talk about in Planters Field is really preparing yourself as a church planter and preparing the soil to be good soil. 
the rocky path, if you prepared it, it could be a good place to plant. It just needed to be prepared. The thorns, if you had gone in and done the work, you could have planted among the thorns. We're going to need people to plant everywhere. But we, we envisioned this planter's field to be a place where they're preparing themselves for what's next. You know, Jeff, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention to those who are listening to us that um, in, in, in church planting uh, as we've done it, it costs a fortune. Okay? Mm. Mm. What you're offering through Planters Field, which, by the way, you can tell us about the website in a minute yeah, where to go sure. find it, but uh, and what you're doing at Planters Field, the cost is not prohibitive. I mean, people can engage with that. But tell us about that. Tell us how you, how you uh, think through establishing a new body of Christians without just throwing money at something. Mm. Yeah, right, right. Because we, we don't have much money to spread around. Yeah, we, <laughs> so. we, we, we don't. I mean, we're all trying to use our money wisely in this season. And, and for those who had been involved in church planting in the past, there were big dollars thrown at things. And some of it worked. Some, some of it didn't. Mm -hmm. But much of it fell on the, mm -hmm. on the path and on the rocky soil and in the, in the thorns. Uh, so we have to be just more strategic in, in this. Um, and it, what, it, what it takes is in this new season are people who are doing it. We're going to have a lot of bivocational pastors, yeah. I think, who are planting. I think we're going to have a lot of lay people who are planting. We're going to have a lot of pastors who go into it without the expectation that they're going to have the financial support of others. And so mm -hmm. how do they gain that? How do they begin to cultivate? Now, this is not prohibitive. Non-denominational do this all the time. <laughs> Other churches do this all the time. It's not, it's the amount of money that we spent did not show any greater success rate than churches that did not put that amount of dollars That's into right. the church plants. And so this is not a, this is not a drawback. We actually are probably in a good place where we're regaining an entrepreneurial spirit to do the work that God called us we're, to do. We are changing the paradigm. I, I don't think there's any question of that. I think part of it is learning that new paradigm. The new churches that we've started have all sprung from lay involvement, right. not from clergy leading, but from other lay folk who come to Jason, who's doing all this for our conference, um, and say, how do we get this started? And before we know it, we have a church that's growing and then calling a pastor to come and lead them. Mm -hmm. So it is um, being formed by lay folks, um, uh, which I, I just find extraordinarily, uh, I'm extraordinarily blessed by seeing that. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so whenever we have the these kind of lay-led movements and uh, we see laity wanting to step forward and being a part of a church plant in their community, that they believe in the gospel message and our, our Wesleyan understanding of it, and they want to lean, lean in, lean forward— what would they find on Planner's Field when they go there? If they if they were to say, I'm I'm going to use this as a lay person, right. as a resource, what would they find mm -hmm. on, on Planner's Field? I was just emailing with a lay person uh, today in Oklahoma who's working with a team of people trying to plant a church, doing this work. And um, so what, what they would find is curriculum, and I was communicating with this person about how to use the curriculum in a way uh, because they want to do it as a team. And so they're going to watch the videos as a team. They're going to work through the worksheets as a team to get to an end goal. And we can talk about that. Um, um, but, but this is a, ultimately a way in which people can learn, okay, how do we establish an evangelism? How do we establish outreach? How do we fund what we're being called to do? How do we prepare ourselves through prayer? What's our own character and competence that we're looking for? How do we develop vision for this? How do we develop mission for this? And one of the things that throughout my time overseeing new church development is that I would have people come to me and they would tell me about the big plans they had for their church, right? I'm, I've got this and we're gonna do this and it's gonna be this big and this is the style it's going to be. And so I would always ask, okay, let me see your plan. And they're like, well, I don't have a plan. And I said, well, what you have is a dream uh, once you get a plan, you'll have a vision and come back to me and let's talk. Uh, and so ultimately, in the end, what we're trying to do is take the dreams that people have, lay people, clergy. We're trying to help them accomplish a plan that comes along with this, that they can have a vision to accomplish what God's calling them to do. God's calling them to do something. How do we help them accomplish that? Man, this conversation has been so rich. I'm, I'm just going to pause here because I, I could get the sense that there's so much more for us to discuss. I want to thank the folks that are listening on Voices of Trinity podcast, and, and you could look forward to having more of this conversation in the future.